Good evening. Wasn't that great? These four people. Jesus is the one who gave him that talent. So we can give him the glory. Ah, well, Pastor Keith called me the other day. And he said, uh, hey, Jim, I finished Ezra. So you can teach on anything you want Tuesday night. I said, what? I'm, I'm, so I had no idea I was supposed to teach Tuesday night. But So anyway, I was trying to figure out what I could teach on because he finished Ezra. And next week he's starting a series on relationships. So, you know, be sure to come next week and, and get in on that. So I was trying to think about who should I, who should I teach on, maybe Buddha, yeah, maybe Muhammad. I settled on Jesus. <laughs> Since at Club Zion, we're all about Jesus. And so tonight we're going to talk about Jesus and who he is and who, what the scriptures say who he is. And, you know, we may think that everybody knows who Jesus is. And they may know the name, they may know about Christmas, they may know Easter. But there's multitudes of people out there who really do not know who Jesus really is, or they have a misguided understanding of who he is. So one of the things, if you're, if you're just saved, if you're new to, new to Christianity, uh, it's all about Jesus. And we give people Bibles, and then they start with Genesis, and, which is pretty interesting, and then they get into Deuteronomy and Exodus and Leviticus, and it's way, you know, they're, they're lost. So I would suggest if anybody's new to Christianity, the thing you want to start out with is the book of John. And if there's anybody in your life that you would like to introduce Jesus to or have asked you about Jesus, give him one of these little books of John. I've got several of them up here, about a dozen. After, afterwards, just come up and grab one. John, like no other apostle, tells about who Jesus is. It's all good. You know, Matthew and Mark and Luke, you know, they talk about Jesus and, and, and his life and what he did. John tells us who Jesus is. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight, not just John. But, and so we're going to open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for our time of worship. Father, we thank you. We know that you're here among us, and uh, we just thank you for Jesus. I ask that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and uh, give us a better understanding of who Jesus really is. And Father, I ask that you get me out of the way so I'm not a distraction. In Jesus' name, I pray. So we're going to go, we're going to cover a few things. They're not in any particular order, but we'll start with Jesus is the Creator and the Sustainer of creation. John 1, 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And you know, we look at creation, we go about our, our day, and we just kind of take it for granted. But if we really stop and think about it a little bit and focus on it, we realize how amazing it really is, how the detail of everything is all the, the, the all the number of plants. My wife's a plant fanatic, and we got plants all over the place. Each one's different, but you know, we God created Jesus created the earth. He created the sun. He put the the, the earth a certain distance from the sun, so that it, we'd have water as we rotate around it during the year. We have the different seasons to plant food that we can eat. Jesus put a magnetic field around the planet that protects us from solar radiation from the sun. The air that we breathe comes from plants and algae. We exhale oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, which is food for those very, very trees. We look up at night and see the stars and galaxies. All those things Jesus created because it says... In John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. I live on the river, and I'm amazed when I go out, and there's dolphins out there, manatees, all kind of fish jumping up and around, turtles. 
There's pelicans who dive bomb my car all the time to wash it every day. And I was sitting, I was in my pool and I saw these little ants going by. And I thought, you know, Jesus made those. It, it's just, uh, it, it, to me, it's amazing. And when you start to think about it and focus on it. Colossians 1, 15 and 16 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. So think about it. When you know, Jesus created the seraphim, he created the cherubim, that we read about up in heaven circling around the throne, holy, holy, holy. Jesus created the angels. And you may not think about this very often, but Jesus created Satan because Satan is an angel. All things that we can't even see with our eye were created. For example, magnetism. Jesus created that. He created gravity. Etc. Cetera, and etc. Cetera. Little things that we can't even see. Electron microscopes go down to, to see an atom. Jesus created all that. And once again in Colossians 1:17, and he, Jesus, is before all things, and in Jesus all things consist. A better translation of that consist would be, and Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things consist hold together. Jesus is holding everything together. And if you really want to th realize that God is past figuring out, think about when Mary is holding baby Jesus in her arms. Jesus is holding Mary together. And at the same time, he's holding the entire universe together. 100% God, 100% man. We can't figure that out. We just got little brains. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. He has in these last days spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he, Jesus, made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things. How does Jesus uphold all things? By the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Second Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, who's the word? Jesus. They're reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So eventually this whole world's going to burn up. And those who are, support global warming will finally be right. So Jesus created all things. Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Christ. All the way from the Garden of Eden to Abraham, to all through the Old Testament, they were looking for the Messiah, the Messiah to come, and that is Jesus. Now, we hear the words Jesus Christ. Well, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's a title. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, meaning anointed one or chosen one. Christos is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, but Ma, ma, ma shish, or Messiah. So Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah or Jesus the anointed one. Now God gave the name Jesus to Mary by the angel Gabriel. And we see that in Luke 1, verse 30. And the angel Gabriel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end. So Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua, which is Y-E-S-H-U-A, if you're taking notes. And Yeshua is a combination of the words Yah, which is an abbreviation of Yahweh. In the Old Testament, the Jews would not write out Yahweh. They would only write out Yah because they, they considered Yahweh was too holy for them to write. So Yeshua is a combination of the word Yah and Yasha, meaning deliverer or save. So Yeshua, when translated into uh, Koine Greek, is Lesus. Translated into English, it's Jesus. Therefore, Jesus' name means Yahweh saves or the Lord is salvation. And we see that in Scripture, that he is the Christ. When the Apostle Andrew heard uh, John the Baptist talking about him, in John 1, 41, he says, he, Andrew, first found his own brother, Simon, who we know as Peter, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. The Samaritan woman at the well, when Jesus was traveling through Samaria, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And then we have Peter's confession in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 15. Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Because the people were saying, well, he's a prophet, he's this, he's that. And he says, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. The apostle John, which we have books here for you if you want them. He records a number of signs that Jesus did. He, you know, re restoring sight to a blind man, feeding 5,000, healing a cripple, raising Lazarus from the dead, turning water into wine, and a number of other things. And why did John do all that? Well, he tells us in chapter 20 and verse, starting in verse 30, John says, truly Jesus did many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus is the promised Christ. He's the creator. He's the promised Christ. Jesus is wisdom. James 3.17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. It's without partiality and without hypocrisy. And in Luke, and the child, Jesus, grew and became strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And all who heard Jesus were astonished at his understanding and answers. Matthew 13, 54. When Jesus had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? In 1 Corinthians, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And later on, when the chief priest and others sent out soldiers to bring Jesus in and they didn't and they asked him why didn't you bring him in in John 7 46 the officers answered no man ever spoke like this man so Jesus is wisdom Jesus is our good shepherd John 10 11 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And we're the sheep. John 10, 14 and 15. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus knows you personally. You're not just a member of a crowd, but he knows you personally, individually, by your name, and he knows everything about you. What's a shepherd do? A shepherd protects his sheep. And only does good for them. Our good shepherd does the same. In Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So Jesus is our good shepherd. Jesus is eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, <clears throat> excuse me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, life eternal. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is life. He's everlasting life. He gives us everlasting life. Jesus tells Martha before he raised Lazarus from the dead in John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's a question for all of us. Do we believe this? 1 John chapter 5, 11, and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son, he who has Jesus, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Chapter 10 of John, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Christ is life itself. Many of you know this. It's kind of like a review. Maybe it's new to some of you. So there'll be a test next week. So, okay. Jesus is righteous. And we're made righteous in Jesus. Romans 3.10 tells us that as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. None of us are righteous on our own by anything we say, anything we do, any work that we, that we accomplish. And Romans 5.19 says, For by one man, Adam... Disobedience, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, Jesus, many will be made righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, the Father, made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. And in Romans 4, 22, 24, they're talking about Abraham here, that he was, he was uh, accounted righteous by his faith, not by any works that he did. And it says, therefore, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, the righteousness being imputed to him, but also for us. Righteousness, it shall be imputed to us who believe in Jesus, who raised up, Jesus, our Lord from the dead. Our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves; It comes from Jesus. It's imputed to us by Jesus. Jesus is the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
And in verse 10, chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it, in Hebrews, it goes on. It says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. When we have Jesus in us with the Holy Spirit, the law is written on our heart. So Jesus is the new covenant. And we, do, we just celebrated, uh, we remembered this new covenant last Sunday when we, we did communion. And in Matthew 26, starting in verse 27, then he, Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Wine was part of the Passover meal. And when we celebrate communion, the wine is symbolic of Jesus' blood. Some... some People profess that when you take the communion, that it is actually you're consuming the blood of Christ. But it's very clear in this verse, because he's, he says, he took the, the cup, and he says in verse 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine, which is the which they're drinking. Grape juice, wine, fruit of the vine. So it's very clear that it's symbolic of the blood that Jesus is going to spill for us in the new covenant. And then in Hebrews 8:6, it says, But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. If you believe in Jesus, the new covenant says, if by faith you'll have eternal life. And that's the better covenant versus trying to obey the law, which you can't do. The law was there to point us to Jesus. Jesus is also the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, you all know this very, very well. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus is the word. And in 1 John 5, 7, it says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, the Trinity. And when Jesus returns to set up his 1,000 year reign here on earth. We see in Revelation 19, starting in verse 13, Jesus was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Luke 9:35. After Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. The voice came out of a cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. He's the word, hear him, listen to him. We have that same command given to us today, hear him. And we can hear him by his word, by reading and studying his word. Jesus is also the Holy One. Psalm 1610. For you will not leave my soul in shoal, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And in Mark 1, 23 and 24. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And in Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 
13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. So Jesus is the Holy One in the Scripture. Jesus is our King. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And in John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus is a king. And in Matthew 21, 5, Jesus says that before his triumphal entry on Palms, what we call Palm Sunday, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fool of a donkey. And in Revelation, when he returns again, these will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And that'll be us. So he's our holy one, he's a king, and he's our peace. Romans 5.1 Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Jesus made peace between us and God by removing our sin barrier. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 16 and 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me, Jesus, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Put your burdens on Jesus. He'll take them. And you'll have peace. Because he tells us in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And how will that peace of God do that? Through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is our peace. And in John chapter 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our advocate and high priest. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus, the righteous. And as we've studied, Pastor Keith has been teaching on Hebrews on Sundays. We see in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Seeing then, we, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. And who is this high priest? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. But in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore, he, Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for him. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 5, There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the only mediator. He's the one we pray to. It's not Mary. Mary's not the mediator. None of the apostles are the mediator. No angel is a mediator. No saint, Christopher, or any of those other little medals are a mediator. Only Jesus. 
And in Hebrews chapter 7, 20, starting in verse 26, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this Jesus did once for all when he offered up himself. So Jesus is an advocate for us when we sin, and he's our high priest. Jesus is also the Lamb of God. John 1, verse 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, look, be amazed, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sacrificial lamb, which everybody knew at that time what that meant because of the sacrifices of the Old Testament. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And in Revelation, saying with a loud voice, the host of heaven say, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. In the Revelation 17, 14, the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus returns, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Jesus is also the author and the finisher of our faith. And Pastor Keith just preached on that Sunday. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And who's the word of God? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jeff. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the creator of our faith and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he, Jesus, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ when he returns. Jesus gave us access to the Father. Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. In Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, That is his flesh. So Jesus, you know, prior to Jesus doing away, going to the cross, we were separated from God. We could not enter the Holy Hall of Holies. We couldn't enter his presence. Only the highest priest could do that. But now that barrier has been removed and we can go as Hebrews 4.16 says let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need so because of Jesus tearing down that barrier we have direct access to the father we don't need to go to a sit in a booth with a priest and have somebody pray for us we have direct access to the father and Jesus gave us that Jesus also made us part of his family. Galatians 4, starting in verse 4. That when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, 
but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And in Romans 8, 14 and 15, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Father. That barrier is broken. We're part of the family. We can go directly to our Heavenly Father. And then Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, you are all sons and daughters of lights and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So Jesus is also the light of the world. John 8, 12, then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the light. He shows us the way. He lights our path because we're in a dark, evil world. And he gives us that light, shows us the way and everything we need. And in Luke 2.32, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. John 1.4, in him was life, Jesus, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. In this dark and evil world, in the darkness, the world does not comprehend it. And in John 12, 46, Jesus says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness, should not have a life living in, this, in, in sin and in darkness. Jesus also saves us from the wrath of God. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides or clings on him. And in Matthew 13, Jesus Tells us, starting in verse uh, 49. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the just, and cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saves us from that if we believe in him. Absolute, have, have absolute faith in him. First Thessalonians. For God did not appoint us those of us who are in Jesus, to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So Jesus saves us from the wrath of God. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And John, who wrote Revelation, he says, Then I saw him. I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Jesus died. And behold, rose from the grave. I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And then he says in Revelation 22, verse, starting in verse 12, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the resurrection. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse starting in verse 42, it says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. 
Jesus is the one that gives us that resurrection, gives us that glorified spiritual body. Jesus is also God. He is the great I am. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Back in Exodus, when Moses, God met Moses in the burning bush, First chapter 3, starting in verse 3, and Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And Jesus says in in John chapter 8, starting in verse 56, he's replying to talking to some of the Pharisees. And he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus is, I am. And in Colossians 2, 8, 10, it says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and all power. In John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Jesus is God. He is the great I am. And when it says, just backing up for a second, when it says, for in Jesus dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, when you're saved, and when Jesus comes in to live with you, you're complete. You don't need anything else. There's not some kind of a second thing that you have to do. There's no two classes of Christians. You accept Jesus, you're complete. Philippians 2, 9-11. Therefore God has also highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the great I am. Jesus is our secure salvation. Hebrews 13.5, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. If you're saved, if you have Jesus, Jesus is never going to run away or kick you out. John 6, 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, believes in Jesus, may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Everyone who believes in Jesus will have everlasting life. I will raise him up at the last day. Your salvation is secure. John 10, chapter, uh, 20, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me, and I will give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And the following verse, I, am the, I and the Father are one. And then Romans eight thirty nine. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ our Lord. So Jesus is, secures our faith. Once you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're never going to lose it. No one's going to take it away from you. As we're coming to the close here, Jesus is the only way. In Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. 
because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So there's this narrow gate that few people find that's going to give them eternal life. I wonder who that gate is. In John 10, verse 9, it says, I am the door. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, Jesus, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Sheep love to have good pasture. And when we're saved, we're going to have a beautiful pasture in heaven. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in Acts 4, 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which me must be saved. So not, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Brahma, not Shiva, not Krishna, not Gandhi, not the Pope, not Mary, nor any other name can save us. Only Jesus. And John 14, 1, 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a great promise. So we just touched on a few things about Jesus tonight, what he does for us, who he is. But we could also go on and say, talk about Jesus as Emmanuel, the bishop of our souls. He's a man of sorrows. He's the rock. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the head of the church. He's the chief cornerstone. He's Shiloh. He's teacher. He's the lion of Judah. He's the bridegroom. He's the only begotten of the Father. He's the true vine. He's the son of man. He's the root of David. He's our Passover. He's ruler, judge, master, servant, faithful and true, everlasting father, bright morning sun, my bright morning star, day spring, our counselor, the beloved, the amen, and much more. He is the I am. He's everything we need. Let's close in prayer. Oh, Father God, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our eternal life. Help us to share this good news with others, Father, so that they too may have eternal life with us. Father, I lift up the mission trip tonight, and I ask that you bless those who went let, uh, let there be many opportunities, many God moments that they can share with us on their return. And we ask that uh, you would bless them and that you would return them safely. And I ask that you bless those who came out tonight to make it a point to learn more about you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.